In this final video for week six, let us discuss decision trees. So essentially a decision tree is a hierarchy of decision stumps. For example, here, 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 and here. The top node is the root node. The end nodes now are the leaf nodes. And then in between, as we discussed in the previous lecture, we refer to data being split at parent nodes which then pass on to child nodes. Nodes reflect questions that we ask of the data, thresholds that we choose, functions that we fit, all on a single choice of feature each time. Edges reflect the answers to those questions, binary choices. So for classification stumps, if a feature value is less than a threshold, it will take the left branch, and if it's more, it takes the right branch. For example, say we have a number of features, measurements taken from patients from which we are interested in building a classifier for diabetes. In this example, these features reflect blood glucose level, age and BMI. At each stump in the hierarchy, we ask a different question from the data on just one of the features. So, for example, the first question we might ask is, whether blood glucose is over 12 millimoles. This is the same as the decision stump example from the previous video. So if the answer is yes, this time data examples take the left branch. However, if the answer would be no, the examples would take the right branch. Then for the next node on the left branch, we ask a second question, is age over 45? If the answer is yes, again it takes the left branch, and no, it takes the right branch. Finally, the third node in this path asks if BMI is greater than 30. Left is for yes, right is no. So this tree structure is created from training data by optimising costs based on learning rules such as the Gini index, information gain, or mean squared distance. Labels of leaf nodes, therefore, are decided on by the population of training examples which reach them. So in this case, the majority of the training examples at leaf 7 were found to have diabetes type 2, and so subsequently when test data is passed down the tree and also ends up in leaf node 7, these examples will be classified with the label diabetes type 2. This is just one path, however. A different example might have said no at the second node, and no again at the third node. Perhaps here it would have received a different label corresponding to diabetes type 1 because it started at a younger age. Equally, a data point might have taken the no path right from the beginning, showing that blood glucose is not over 12 millimoles. Accordingly, perhaps it ends up in a leaf node which indicates that the patient is healthy or has a different condition. So hopefully these toy examples highlight what's good about decision trees. Firstly, they are relatively easy to interpret as they result from a hierarchy of simple decisions made based on thresholds on individual features. Secondly, they also require minimal pre-processing of the data. In particular, it is not necessary to normalise features because each node considers each feature in isolation. So it's not possible for features with larger ranges to dominate the decision. Most importantly, they can be used to perform regression or classification and multi-output or multi-class problems, whilst requiring minimal changes to be made to the underlying algorithm. Looking at classification and regression trees in more detail, imagine we had a multi-class classification problem where each colour of icon and each shape represents a different class. So we need to partition up this feature space into segments which optimally separate the data classes. We do this with axis aligned classifiers, thresholds on the features, and here we only have two features to choose from, x1 and x2. So we might imagine that at the root node it decides that it can best unmix the data by fitting a threshold down the middle of the x1 feature. This largely separates the pink asterisks red plus signs and yellow question marks from the light blue crosses and the dark purple circles. This is with the exception of one red plus sign. So now the left branch takes all of the pink and yellow classes and the right branch takes the blue and purple and the red plus class goes down both branches. 
Now exploring the left branch further, at the second node, the best split of the data will clearly now be given by splitting on the X2 feature, perhaps here. This almost completely separates pink asterisks from yellow question marks, although again, red goes down both branches. At the final level of the tree, we learn a threshold on X1 for each of these branches, which splits the red crosses from the pink and yellow icons. Now, most of our training examples are cleanly split, and so each of our leaf nodes can be assigned a class equal to the majority class of the training examples reaching that node. So the first leaf will be given the label of yellow question marks, the second will be given the class of red plus signs, the third pink asterisks and the last leaf node of the initial left branch will also get a red plus sign label. Regression on the other hand works slightly different, so rather than learning a threshold and assigning a class at the end, each leaf learns a constant function which is fit to all the points in that branch. So for example, on the root node, the data might be thresholded at x equals 3, to which a constant function with the value of y equals 6 is fit to the left branch, and y equals minus 1.1 to the right branch. At the next level of the tree, focused on the left branch from the root, the left branch stays as y equals 0.6, but the right branch is raised to 1.1. And in the final split, the left branch is raised to 1.6, but the right stays at 1.1. In this way, for different ranges of the feature space, a different cost function is fit. The leaf nodes are then each assigned a predicted fit. In the first four examples, 0 0.9, 0.1, 1.6 and 1.1. This is a fairly coarse fit. A closer approximation would be achieved with deeper trees. However, you must be cautious, as this example from Scikit-Learn shows, since if maximum depth of the tree is set too high, the decision tree learns two fine details of the training data and may start to overfit. So what is the process involved in fitting a whole decision tree? Essentially, it is as simple as learning a hierarchy of decision stumps. However, there are some key implementational points to be aware of. So firstly, you will not know the optimal feature a priori. It will need to be searched for. As we will see in Tuesday's example, this will mean looping over each feature, which in our case will be every column of our data matrix except for the one that corresponds to the data label. At each of these features, we must try all possible thresholds. In practice, this amounts to thresholding on the value of each of the examples for that feature and seeing how this splits the data. So taking the toy example that we showed in the previous video, to do this, we would iterate over trying thresholders 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, and so on, trying all of the values, but recording each time when the cost improves, and so keeping track of the value of the best performing threshold. To quantify which cost is best, we need to use a learning rule, like those we saw in the previous video lecture. For example, the Gini index or information gain for classification or mean square error for regression. As you iterate, you must keep track of the best performing feature through a variable, let's call it kopt, which you must update every time you find a feature with a better cost. We'll call the best cost iopt and, of course, a best threshold, tauopt. So this means that you need to keep track of optimal costs and thresholds across all features as you loop over them. These collectively represent the parameters that you will need every time you pass data down this tree. Then, once you've got the best result for that tree node, you must split the data according to that function and start the process all over again for the next tree node, J plus 1, and keep going until some termination criteria is met. For example, an obvious one would be that you've run out of data to split. In other words, there's one example in each leaf node. However, this likely means that you've gone too far and it puts you at danger of overfitting. So usually a max depth parameter is set or a minimum number of examples allowed for each leaf node. Once you've reached that point, the final thing you need to do is assign a label to each leaf node. And you do this by exploring the training labels of all the examples reaching that node. 
So in the case of classification, it would be the majority class of these examples. And for regression, you would fit a constant function to the mean. So as we go on in Tuesday's tutorial to fit this process for a single decision stump and optionally to create a whole tree depending on your interest, these are some key points to remember. First, be mindful of whether the cost must be maximised or minimised when picking the best feature. Second, selecting a feature reduces to slicing different columns from your data matrix, though be mindful that in the example in the tutorial, the last column will be the data label, so you must not iterate over that. Third, obviously as you pass down the tree, the training examples will get split up into chunks and the number of examples therefore will change as you move from each parent node to each child node. And finally, and most importantly, each tree is defined by a hierarchy of nodes completely characterised by which feature was split on and which threshold was used each time. So you need to keep track of these. During training, as per point three, you also need to know which training examples pass down which branches. Thus, algorithmically, each node of our tree is represented by a dictionary, which stores, for each node, keys which define the index of the feature that is split on, the value of the threshold on that feature which optimises the cost, and a tuple containing two data arrays each containing the data examples for the left and right branches. This is for one level, so for subsequent levels the branch key is replaced with new dictionaries which represent the splits of the data for each child node. So this results in the whole tree being represented by a nested dictionary. Importantly, once you reach a leaf node, the branch keys must record the label class assigned to that leaf node, such that then, when you subsequently test, it's possible to pass the test examples down the same function which reads that nested dictionary, and these will then go through the same process, splitting on the optimal feature for each node j, using the threshold tau opt j, and passing down either the left or right branches depending on the outcome of that threshold operation. So at the end, Test examples will be assigned the label of the leap that they reach. So that is the process of how to implement a decision tree from scratch. But of course, on Tuesday, we will also look at implementing trees using scikit-learn. These, as you can see, offer a large number of different parameter choices. However, many of these are motivated for use with ensemble learning, which we will study next week. So for now, we only really need to think about a choice for the max tree depth or the minimum number of samples that we want at each leaf node. And of course, the choice of criterion. So genie or information gain for classifiers, a mean square error or mean absolute error for regression. Then, as with all scikit-learn prediction models, we must instantiate, fit, and then predict. Note that while decision trees are very flexible, they are typically considered weak learners themselves because they can be prone to overfitting, particularly if tree depth is not controlled. Next week, we will therefore see how the power of decision trees can be increased by combining many of them together in ensembles such as random forests. So in summary, decision trees are hierarchies of decision stumps. They're powerful because they're easy to interpret, can be used for classification or regression, and they don't require tiresome pre-processing tricks like normalization of all features to prevent any one from dominating. When fitting each decision stump, you must go through the process of iterating over all features, finding the optimal threshold for each feature, and ultimately choosing the feature which performs best, has the optimal cost relative to all others given the training examples which reach that node. Don't forget that in order for these to result in a prediction algorithm, the leaf nodes must be assigned a label. This is determined from the distribution of labels of the training examples which reach that node. Finally, the simplicity of decision trees means that they are essentially still weak learners. Robustness to generalization can be increased through combining them in ensembles, which will be covered next week. So that's it for decision trees. Please do complete the Keats quiz to test your understanding of these concepts and I will see you in Tuesday's tutorial.